We start with this uh, our second uh, invited speaker. So uh, our second invited speaker is uh, Jean Raymond uh, Adrian. Uh, he's a co-inventor of the formal methods approaches Z, B, and Event B, which has been widely used uh, in in industry. B has uh, been used in the control of the 14 metro, metro line in Paris. Uh, event B, I saw so that was uh, recently used in uh, in the security aspects of the uh, 17 subway line in, in New York City. Uh, he is also author of the B book, and uh, uh, the first time uh, I read the, the B book, it, it gave me a sort of tick, as he uh, he likes to say uh, about the events in, in Event B, and uh, so I decided that it, were, it was really very important to uh, include a formal methods course in the mainstream of uh, our undergraduate uh, computer science programs. So I managed to convince uh, officials, uh, uh, thanks to, uh, to this book, uh, this course is now part of our curriculum. Uh, um, he also published recently uh, another book in uh, system modeling with uh, event B. Uh, for system and software engineering. Uh, he was a uh, professor from uh, 2003 to uh, 2007, I think, in ETH Zurich, where he led the development, uh, uh, he led the uh, Ploy project, uh, which ended up in the construction of the Roda uh, tool for uh, even B. Um, more recently, he is also involved as a researcher in ETH Zurich in the advanced project, uh, which is developing uh, a, a formal environment for cyber physical uh, systems. Um, well, this project involves also many universities, the University of Southampton, uh, 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 Dossendorf, and also the industry, like uh, companies like uh, Alstom in France, Sister L, well, and, and others. Uh, recently, uh, he has also been invited uh, as a researcher and also as a teacher in many Chinese universities in Shanghai, Peking, uh, where he has uh, taught courses in informal methods and also has done uh, research. Uh, uh, dealing with uh, event B and formal, um, formal methods. Uh, Professor Arial has been a consultant also for over 20 years, working always in relation with the industry and uh, universities. So um, I'm really very glad to welcome uh, Jan Ragnarok and uh, look forward to uh, for his talk. for your introduction and uh, also thank you very much for inviting me here. Um, I remember when I received your, your first mail um, in, in April of last year and then later on I received also another mail from uh, Frank. So both, both of you, to both of you many many thanks. Uh, uh, I have been in many countries in, um, in uh, South America but I, was, uh, I never came to uh, to Colombia, so I'm very pleased to um, uh, to visit Colombia for a, in this uh, in this occasion. Thanks again. Um, my title is is a bit strange. Uh, all the words are important: an exercise, mathematical engineering, and uh, stating and proving Kuratowski theorem. So first of all. Mathematical engineering, what does that mean? Second, the term of Kuratowski, what a strange subject for a computer science uh, conference, and especially for, for a theoretical computer science uh, conference. 
Uh, let me let me explain um, these these things and try to convince you with many question mark. Um, I always have thought that mass mathematics and programming are strongly related, and this is what uh, the previous speaker told us um, uh, before. Um, and I have often observed that um, mathematically educated people are quite good. In, in particular in, in industry. However, the vast majority of computer professor, professional is not mathematically educated. And so my idea is how could we have more mathematics inserted in various computer science curriculum? Uh, what and what kind of mathematics should we add to such a curriculum? Um, in my view, the precise mathematical subject is not so much important. What counts is the organization of the context of the mathematical subject. When you read some uh, mathematical book, um, they, they also describe the domain, the main domain um, of the subject, and this is what I call the context. So context is a background needed to formalize a math subject with definitions, axiom, imported or intermediate result, proof, of course, etc. So <clears throat> my, my claim is that this mathematical context is not so different from similar context encountered in software. So that's the reason why um, the, the description um, and the study of this mathematical context could be good um, uh, for, um, uh, to, to be inserted into, um, in, into computer science uh, curriculum. Um, so I will, I will say more about this in a minute. So the idea, why not incorporating such example in, in computer science curriculum? And in order to make this idea more precise, I started to dig in some math books and, and, and articles. I'm not, I'm not, I do not pretend to be a professional mathematician, but I, can, I, I think I can understand some mathematics. So my goal was to construct a, a database of such a mathematical context and uh, use it and present it to some students and to see how do, to, do, do they react to this material. But, but, I quickly discovered that mathematical context taken from books and articles are often badly structured. At least, it, it's very subjective uh, view. Hard to understand for me, with important definitions sometimes just missing, and curiously enough, not abstract enough, which is very strange because mathematics by excellence should be the, the realm of, um, of abstraction. So after all, taking all this mass work directly as such was not so much a good example. So I had no choice but to reconstruct by myself some of this mathematical context. And now we come to the, the definition of mathematical engineer. In fact, um, maybe this, this, this word is not exactly the good one. I, I should have written mathematics engineer, like software engineer. So, so the idea is to incorporate into the definition of those mathematical contexts some um, systematic way, which is the way we do it in, in, in software development. So this presentation is to show to you such an attempt. It's not perfect, certainly. Uh, it's, it's an exercise, and here we have the definition of, of, of this uh, exercise. Ah, so, um, it is questionable, uh, so don't hesitate to complain or to, or to, or to argue. And I've chosen the, the theorem of Kuratowski because the statement is very simple. It's a, it's a theorem on graph. And the, the usual presentation which I found in the internet are uh, complicated, at least 
for me, again, this is very subjective. So, <clears throat> this theorem states a simple characteristic property of planar graphs. Um, this property, I will define it later. So, for the, for the moment, we just um, uh, focus on, um, on a planar graph. So, the definition of a planar graph is very simple. There exists a planar drawing, and we will see the, the differences between a graph and a graph drawing, where edges intersect on vertices only. So, here on the left, we have a planar graph. And on the right, we have a non-planar graph because we, because the, the edge, the red edge, crosses the horizontal black one on a point which is not um, a node of the graph, not a vertex of the graph. Uh, it is easy to have an immediate feeling of the problem of planarity. Here is a well-known problem. You have three houses, and you have gas, water, and electricity and we want to join um, gas pro uh, provider, uh, water and electricity with, with some pipes or, or some tubes and, uh, and we do not want these things to cross uh, because it might be, it might be dangerous. So if the graph is not planar when we add an edge from, um, from the gas to the middle house here we, uh, if we have this one. So this notion of planarity is, is um, uh, easy to understand. Uh, some reference, the, the theorem of Kuratowski was uh, defined in a, in a first article written in, in French in 1930 sur le problème des courbes gauche en topology. And, uh, and, there, and then I read some uh, article, another in French, and um, a refinement, um, and then a constructive proof and then I bought this book on um, graph algorithm, um, which was a, a recent republication of, of this book. Um, the proof <coughs> I found in all these papers are not so simple for me. Um, also develop sometimes their context in a way that is not abstract enough. Um, I discovered slightly that this is more a problem of topology than a problem of, of pure graph theory. Um, some, some cases are often missing in, in proof by cases. Um, so you have, you have to provide yourself uh, all, all the cases. Um, many also use drawing um, as justification in, in their proof. I found this horrible statement somewhere as demonstrated in figure 7.3 so i was horrified when i when i saw this um, and on some slides because because on the internet you can also get slides of it some proofs are missing because um the proofs are too complicated so the poor students when they see the, those slides um are, are a bit misled because they don't see they don't see really the proof of this of this theorem so the outline of my presentation is to um, is the following. I will try to use technique of software engineering, mainly um, abstraction, refinement, and, and proof, of course, um, in order to define the mathematical context. So rather than starting immediately with with graph, I define an abstract notion of regions. And then I define on this region um, some relations, and then I connect regions, and then I define regions precisely with, with graph. So you see, we, we will proceed step by step exactly the way we should proceed in software engineering, formalized software engineering. And, um, and also I provide some uh, intersection axioms because this is the basis of planarity, this is the intersection between, uh, between edges. And eventually, but eventually at the end, after, after this big mathematical context here, I go on to the theorem, which is not what I have seen in the proof that, that, uh, where I, I have seen on, uh, on the internet. People start immediately with, with the graph, and there is a mixture of um, context within the proof, um, which makes for me, again, very, very subjective, 
things um, 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 been difficult. Some remarks. Importance of the preliminary context. You, you see the, the preliminary context before the proof is all, all this. Or using abstraction, this is what I've said already, region, using refinement, graphs, um, and an introduction of some axioms able to be eventually instantiated. So I'm, I'm using all these, uh, all these ingredients. So let's start with region. I suppose we are given a set P of points, probably uh, an infinite set, and uh, we are given a finite set R of regions, and uh, regions are defined by the exterior, the interior, and the border, and, uh, and these elements for each region define three set of points. So we have seen, we, we can see here when we have all, all the points here, all the points everywhere, and uh, we have a region here, we have the interior, which corresponds to, the, the, the set of points for the interior corresponds to, to all this, we have the exterior, and we have um, the border. And the main property is that exterior, interior, and border of each region partition the set of points. Okay, when uh, they, they are incompatible, and when you take the, their union, you get you get all all the points. So this is the definition of a region. Let's collate <coughs> regions. Regions could be we, we we might have two two or more regions, and they could be uh, external to each other. Uh, they can be internal to each other, uh, or they can be internally tangent. Um, and in this, 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 there is a very precise definition here. We must have a common, uh, a common border, but the interior of this one is inside, and the border, except this part, is, um, uh, in, is inside the biggest one. And the more interesting one, uh, this is an externally tangent region. There are the ones we are interested in. And again, um, in order to have two regions to be externally tangent, they, they have to share some part of the border um, corresponding to this, uh, the, the limit corresponding to these two points, and, um, and then they, are, they can be defined as externally tangent. So there is a little thing which I've not defined in, 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 in this. When, when you have two regions and they are connected just on one point of their border, they are considered to be um, external to each other. So this drawing here, this drawing here should be um, enlarged to uh, here have another region which just have one point in common with, with this one and they will be considered to be external. Okay? Um, building new regions. So let R1 and R2 be two externally tangent regions. Putting them together, we form another region R3 together with R1 and R2. So <coughs> um, uh, we have R1 and R2, and uh, they are externally tangent. We can remove this uh, common border here, and that gives us uh, another, another region. So this is the way we can build new regions. And of course, the interior of R1 and R2 are strictly included into that of, of, of R3, okay? So you see, play, playing, playing just with the definition of interior, exterior, and, and border, with, with the fact that the three of them partition the set of points, we can, um, uh, we, we, we can reason about, about region. And we can prove that this new region here is in the, this new thing here is indeed a region because it has got the, the, the characteristic property of region about interior, exterior, and border. So from now on, we are considered only system of connected region um, that are directly or indirectly connected by external tangency. So two, two regions might be external to each other, but in between we have some uh, externally um, uh, tangent uh, regions. In, in other words, there is no isolated region, so we, we, we are just 
we are choosing this this kind of situation. So what you can see here on this on this drawing is that there are far more than four regions because of course um, we can we can remove this and that gives us a biggest region. In fact, there are thirteen different regions. Ah, now the notion of maximum region. A maximum re uh, a maximal region with a certain property p means a region which cannot be extended by external tangency without losing the property P. So here is a drawing. Um, we, have, we have this system of, of, of regions. And here, the region which, which border A, D, C, E, B is a maximum region with A, B in its border. This is a property to have A, B in its border. And there is another one, which is a, E, C, D, B. So we, we, we might have not necessarily a single maximum region, but we might have, have uh, several of them. So this is a definition of a maximum region. So you see, we go slowly to, to, to construct this thing. region, externally tangent region, um, and then the notion of a maximum region with a certain property. And we are interested in the fact, mainly in the fact that we have region with A, B in, it, in its border. And you see, this, this region here is a region obtained by, by removing this um, uh, border and this border. Um, also, remember that at this point, I don't speak at all of graph and edges and, and, uh, um, and node of graphs and vertices. So, an, an important theorem, we are given a system of connected regions. We are given two distant points in the border of some regions. <laughs> and the theorem is there exists a maximum, re, re, a maximum maximal region with this two points in its border. Here is a drawing. So, we have a system of connected regions here. I, I have this point and this point. I'm interested in this. And I, I'm interested, and I say by this, by this theorem, which is proved in the, in the paper, not here, uh, that there is a maximum region with these two points in its border. So this is this region. Some of the border are outside, because if I add by external tangency this region here, I will lose this point, which should not be anymore in the border. And the same, and the same here. Whereas, uh, whereas um, I, I have added systematically these values of region and that does not change the property to contains um, A and B in the, uh, the two point in the board. Graph. Ah, now, only now I come on to, on to graph, so I will, I will refine. And the definition I'm going to use here is less general than the usual one. And uh, the reason why I use only this one is because it is sufficient to present the theorem of Kuratowski. I've not yet defined the theorem of Kuratowski, of course, because first I have to define graph, I have to define planar graph, and I have to define eventually to, seek to, to say the property corresponding to the theorem of Kuratowski. And so <coughs> the notion of graph, it is a refinement of the concept of connected region. So we are given a system of connected regions, and we are given a finite set V of points on, on borders of this connected region. I call them the vertices. And there is a binary relation VR between vertices. And this relation is symmetric, irreflexive, and connected. So this, this gives you a, a limited um, kind of, of graph with regard to the normal definition of, of graph. And uh, this relation VR characterize, uh, characterizes the graph we are interested in, uh, which means that in, in graph theory, you, you might have two connections between two points, two edges, which, which is here completely eliminated. Um, we could have also um, uh, a, uh, um, a point, a, a vertex, connected to itself. And, uh, uh, this is eliminated here because this VR is irreflexive. So, you see, uh, this is what I've said before, we have a limited, um, a limited definition of, of graph. So here is a vertex illustration. I have, um, I have five vertices. 
um, in this story. So V, V, the set V of vertices is V1, V2, V5, and VR is just the, 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 the set of, of pairs. We go, from, um, we go from V1 to V2, V2 to V3, etc. Now the, um, so a graph is simply formalized by the binary relation between its vertices. Edges, so we are given a finite set E of, um, that we call the edges, and uh, an edge is made of a set of points of the border of a region. So, and there is a bijection in this limited definition of, 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 of graph, a, a bijection VE between pairs of vertices VR and E. So, um, but the two vertices involved in an edge are the only vertices belonging to that edge. I will generalize this in, in a further slide. So you see the illustration here. We have, um, and, and we have indeed a bijection between the, um, between the VR, the relation between vertices, and the edges. So you see, you see V here, the red. You see E, the blue. You, we have uh, until eight. VR, I copied the VR from the previous slides, and here VE is a bijection, so V1, V2 is associated with E5, V2, V3, V2, V3 is associated with E8, so all edges are in a one-to-one, one-to relation with elements of um, a pairs appearing in, in VR. Okay, so this is, this, is, this is all. So you see again how we slowly go down. Now chains, a chain, um, it's part of a, of a region border linking, linking two vertices A, A and B e is a chain and this part may contain other vertices besides A and B. So notice that the chain contains, certainly contains other non-vertex points because all the points, all the points in, in, inside or in the border are not all vertices of course. And also notice that a chain could be an edge, of course. However, a chain containing more than two vertices is not an edge. Here is an illustration. So you, you see this, this chain here, E1, E5, E7, E4. <coughs> so this is a chain because uh, this is part of, of borders. And this is a chain because uh, it's not an edge of, uh, from V4 to V3 because we, we have several edges involved. So vertices, edges, and chain. Now we can define a notion of subgraph, which is very, very trivial, given a graph G and a relation VR between vertices. Another graph with less vertices than G and whose relation is included into VR is said to be a subgraph of G. Uh, it must be a subgraph R from the definition of graph I have defined. Ah, so now I'm going to present to you the most important slide of this presentation. Graph and graph drawing. We make the distinction between the two. Here is a graph with, defined with this relation. And a graph drawing is an image of the relation we are on a plane. And uh, here are two different graph drawings of this graph. There are more. And, and you see, you can, you can see that the relationship is both in both images here, the relationship is always the same, but the image is different. Here we go from V3 to V4 as an edge outside with the exterior part of, of, of this um, region, and here we go in the, with the interior part of, of, this, of this region and symmetrically. But we, are, we have many, many more graph drawing, of course, for the same graph. So it is very, very important to make the, di the distinction. And precisely, this is the way we are going to define planarity. So <coughs> um, now what we, are, what we could do is, with given a graph, so essentially a relation between vertices, we can associate a set of graph drawings. Here we have we have two we have two graph drawings here, um, and there are uh, there are obviously far more, and and all all the graph drawing for this same graph here uh, um, is, is put in a set a set of drawing of of this graph, um, and a graph extension 
We are given a graph G and a set of graph drawing associated with, with it, S, G, D. Let A and B, A and B be two distinct vert vertices of G, and we suppose that there is no edge between A and B. And of course there is a chain, because, because remember VR is connected. So um, if we add an edge between A and B, this results in a new graph H. So the set SGD of graph drawing corresponding to G is going to be extended by adding edge, edges between A and B in all the drawing of, in all different ways, external, internal to corresponding region. And this resu result in a new set SHD of equivalent graph drawing for H. I say equivalent because they are all equivalent because they, are, they correspond to the same, to the same graph. Um, illustration of graph extension, we have, we have um, a graph G and we have part of the graph drawing, we have these two ones, and, uh, and here you see we, we want to add an edge, this is what, remember this is what I have said, that there is no edge between, um, between the, the, the point we choose, so we add this one. We, we could add it also in, in, in this graph drawing. Um, or um, we, can, um, we can add externally here, or we can add externally, the other one being externally. So what is interesting is that we can see here, ah, the cross on the point which is not an edge, and also here, but here it's okay. So we are not too far now to define um, the planar graph definition. A graph G is said to be planar if there exists a, dra a drawing of G where all edges intersect on vertices only. So here you see three, three um, graph drawings and uh, these one are okay because there, there is no intersection, these one are not, but there exists at least a drawing. So we have this, we have, <laughs> we have, we have two of them, probably also more, and so we can say for, for this reason, this, this graph is planar. If a graph is not planar, uh, it means that they are all black, okay? There are, there, 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 there are always connection by in points here which are not, and, uh, which are not vertices. So <coughs> here is a, is a non-planar graph, key K33, we have already seen it. Each vertex in, in, in a set is connected to all vertices in, in, in the other set. We, we have two sets of three, verses, three, ver, uh, three vertices each. And uh, uh, this is here, and, and you can see, you can see that um, if we add this connection here, the graph <coughs> drawing, which is here, is not, um, um, is not planar. And, um, and again, this, this is the same thing as we have seen already in the in previous, previous slides. When we add this, the graph becomes non-planar. So it can be proved that K33 is, is not planar. I'm not doing this proof here. The proof of this in, in, in the literature are not too bad. And there is another one which is called K5. So K5, we have five vertices. And each vertex is connected to the four others, so it's very, very simple. And K5 is also proved to be non-planar. So here you see that uh, this vertex here is connected, is connected to these three. Um, um, uh, the same here, the same here. Um, one, two, three, four. Uh, but we have problem for this vertex and problem for, for this vertex because we have no, no other way to, to link them. Because you remember an edge could be in a drawing, could be inside or outside a certain region. So if we put this one outside, it goes here like this and going here like this, it, it, it is crossing uh, this way. It can, move, it can go also this way, but then again we cross, we cross this way. So K Remember this, remember this, K33 is not planar, and K5 is not planar. We are not too far from the definition of the Kuratowski theorem. So we generalize now K33 and K5, 
um, case list, gen case list, V and gen K5, look the same as case list V and K5. The only difference between the two is that the links between vertices can be made um, of some chains instead of just edges. So, so here in, in, in this case, or, or in, in this case, um, this is, these are clearly edges connecting these things here. So in gen K3 or in gen K5, um, we, could have, we could have connection uh, exactly just in the same way, but these are um, uh, defined by, gen, uh, by generalizing the connection with, with, um, with chain, chains instead of just edges. So how can we characterize gen K3-3? Two sets of, with three vertices in each of them, and chains linking each vertex in one set with the vertices in the other. Character, characterizing gen K4, a set containing five vertices, and chains linking each vertex to the four others. Chains, not edge. Um, ah, and now, uh, before entering into the, um, the theorem, I define some, some axioms um, in graph drawings. In the paper, all, all the drawings that have that been shown on the slides are represented systematically by some um, uh, predicate, uh, set-theoretic predicate. Um, uh, here, the, fir the first axiom here, we have uh, no intersection. Here, we have either no intersection, but, but here we have intersection, and also here we have intersection. So, these this are called which are called the intersection axioms, and we are going to use it in the proof. So, that's it. Our context is finished, and it takes quite a long time to, to just define uh, this, this context. Now we are ready to define the Kiratowski theorem. Um, it has two parts. A normal planar graph contains gen K33 or gen K5 as subgraph. And a graph containing the reverse statement, a graph containing gen K33 and gen K5 as subgraph is non planar And what we are going to prove is um, this part, which is the most, uh, the most difficult. And uh, this, is, um, this is where I found it difficult in, in, the, in the literature. Uh, the proof I'm going to use is, uh, in, I'm going to present, a sketch of it is an inspired by the proof by uh, even in a graph, um, graph algorithm book. Sketch of the proof, we are given, we start from a planar graph. So remember the definition of planar graph. We, we have some, um, some drawing which, which where things are connected only in, in, on vertices, where edges are connected to vertices. So let A0 and B0 be two, two distinct vertices with no edge between them. We extend G by linking A0 to B0 with a new edge. And I have defined clearly the definition of extending a graph and extending the graph drawing, the corresponding graph drawing. And this results in a new graph H. And we suppose now that the graph H is non-planar and by just adding this, this edge. So, um, and we are going now to prove that edge contains J, gen K33 and gen K5 as subgraph, as subgraph, and I've defined carefully as subgraph. So let GD be the graph, uh, graph drawing of G where all, all edges intersect on vertices. It exists because G is planar. And ah, and now I'm going to use my definition of a maximum region. Maximum region. Let R be a maximum region of GD containing A0 and B0. And by linking A0 to B0 with a new edge inside R, inside this maximum re maximum region, we obtain a new graph drawing HD. So here, here is a this region, which is supposed to be maximal, containing A0 and B0. And, um, and, and now this is a partial view. So this, this thing is supposed to be planar. And now I'm adding A0 to B0. And this thing is, is supposed to be non-planar. And now I, I want to prove something about it. 
So there must exist a vertice, um, uh, two vertices, A1 and B1, situated on each part of the, of the edge of A0 and B0, and B0, and linking by a chain outside R. Otherwise, a new edge A0, B0 could be moved outside R in other drawing. So, <coughs> so here, this is what, what, um, what I said here, what I claim, and I, I can prove it carefully. Um, there must exist um, two points, and uh, there must exist an outside, an outside link, a uh, chain in general, um, um, uh, because if the, the, uh, we have this, if, there, if this does not exist, then we can move this outside and this will be Kana. And, um, and we suppose also that A1, B1 are on each side. And we suppose also that A1 and B1 is, is the smallest, is minimum. Um, so now the edge A0, B0 must intersect the chain A2, B2. And we have three main cases. And we use, for studying these three main cases, the intersection axioms. So case one, uh, we suppose that we have uh, A2 is in, in, in this part, but not, not on A0 and A1, and B2 is in this part, and not in B0 and B1. So we clearly, have, after the intersection axioms, we have, um, we have an intersection here. And Jake K33 is characterized, oops, is characterized by, um, by these two sets. Uh, two subcases of case, of case one, we have a symmetry. So these are the two cases, subcases of case one. Uh, an example of case one is, is here. We have A0, B0, and we have A2, B2, which is, which is like this, which is a, um, uh, an instantiation, so to speak, of, of this. Case two is, um, is uh, this one. Um, we suppose that A2 is still there, but B2 could be in A, A, A0, B1, could be in A, excluding B0 until, until B1. And we have inside a, a, a vertex of B and, and uh, B2 prime. Of course, this is a special case, this is a special case of case one, so we can eliminate it. And um, uh, in fact, um, uh, we, um, we have just uh, we have just a case where either B2 prime is here or B2 is here, uh, or both are in B0 and B1. And this is defined here. And so genuine cases are just a case where I, I define, and, and, and then G case is, is, is defined, um, is characterized here. So um, these are the two, um, the, the, the three cases. Um, and the more cases with symmetric, vertical or horizontal symmetric, um, we have symmetric. Uh, we have all these cases. And here is an example of case two. Case three is uh, things where things are in A1 and B1. And um, we have uh, either case three, three or we have K5. And here is a case with, um, uh, is an example with K5. Um, so concluding, uh, we have to be uh, uh, very precise in defining the various cases. I've not been very precise in the presentation, but it's more precise in, in, in the paper. We have to check the exhaustivity of the three cases, which is usually not done in practice, and all this is done in detail in the paper. Concluding the remark, an approach like this has to be presented, of course, very, very slowly to students. One as to point out comparison with classical presentations, say, say we are more precise and very precise with regard to classical presentation, and with lots of question mark, relate this to similar approaches in software engineering. Um, concluding remark two, I made other attempts with the theorem of Gutstein, which, which is work in progress, formal construction of the real out of the, uh, without the rational, Theorem of Cantor Bernstein, which I've presented in, in, the, in the tutorial. The theorem of Furstenberg on prime numbers, uh, well founded and fixed point, etc. And in, uh, I also recognize some of, of these things. Muchas gracias. Thank you.
uh, John Ramon, it is very nice talk. And we'll take some questions now. Hey, thank you for the talk. Uh, nowadays you see many people using systems like COG to prove different uh, theorems. And COG uh, uses um, a given underlying logic. Um, I was wondering uh, which kind of tools and mathematical theories you have you used behind to prove the kind of result that you've been showing us? Um, certainly, COG Certainly, Coco is a very could could be used. Um, so far, I've not done anything more than this and more than what is it in the paper. And I intend to use the the, the Rodin toolset for even B for for doing this. Uh, I'm pretty confident. Uh, I've not done it, so I cannot say I succeeded. But I'm pretty confident that uh, that this can be this can be done because you know all all what I've presented is extremely simple. So. Um, but, but yes, of course, it could be defined with, with other systems, or, or, or HOL, or Isabel, or any you know, other system. Yeah. So, you started, you started somehow talking about education. How, how, do you see it, how do you see this being embedded in an in educational framework? Well, that's, that's a problem. That's the reason why, why I, I just said to you that this is, this is an exercise. So, so this, this idea is, is to continue to have more, more examples um, of this and, and then um, to write very, very carefully uh, text and, um, and slides and uh, in, part, in part of the curriculum, uh, or in computer science of the curriculum, either in, at, at various level, or to introduce, to introduce these things, okay, to, ex to explain Again, the idea is to explain that the, the technique used to do this mathematical engineering could be could be technique that we could use also to do software engineering. And uh, of course, uh, what I have not done yet is precisely um, precisely this this connection here, okay. and that has to be that has to be extended. Uh, very carefully for to, to say to the student, look, the mathematician has done it this way in software engineering uh, and, and taken maybe another an, an example of software engineering formal context development and and to say the analogy and of course also the difference. But but what my subjective view is is that uh, this is very 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 clear. But that's, that's just subjective. Thank you. I enjoyed your development of the context very much. And I agree with just true mathematics. Sorry, I, I cannot hear you. Uh, what you presented is the development of context. It's very enjoyable and I agree with true mathematics. It's like music, but did I understand right that you uh, say that it was inspired by software engineering? <coughs> you mean this idea to develop context step by step? It's true mathematics, but it seems you you say that uh, you borrowed the idea from software engineering. Are you sure it's from software engineering? It's just mathematics. I'm I'm, I'm not sure. I finished it. Okay, this, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is just a proposal, this is just a proposal, that, and that doesn't exist yet, of course, but, but um, again, I, I think, and, and remember the first, the first slides, okay, usually com computer people in industry have a very bad mathematical background. And usually they choose computing because they don't like mathematics. Nevertheless, I'm sure that if, and I, I've seen that many, many times with people who have a, a, a culture of mathematics, they are, they are, they are good. So, so the idea, how could we 
present mathematics in a way to people who have difficulties in mathematics in order to um, insert some mathematical culture into, into their computing culture. But that's, that's, that's a beginning. I, I'm, not pro I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that it works. Okay, but I, I, thanks to this invitation, I present that to you as a possibility now. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm completely wrong. <laughs> I hope I'm not, uh, but um, I, I think this is a proposal. No, I believe you are completely right. Material, material has to be written and books have to be written on, on this. And, uh, and this mathematical engineering. But, but in fact, um, in fact um, people working with, with Scott, as we know, have, have done tremendous results uh, with some very difficult mathematical theorem like uh, the Foucault theorems and, and, and all the theorems. And so this thing already exists, but it's only known by a, a, a very limited number of people. So my, my idea is to enlarge it and to choose, this is the reason why I've chosen this theorem, to, to choose some, some well-known theorem that are not too difficult to, to, to just understand, but whose proof uh, uh, pose some, some problem. Exactly like software engineering. Usually you, you see what you have to do. But it's difficult to implement it. It's just a problem with it. Okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Jean, well, that, that, was, that was very beautiful. Um, I guess the theorem could be used as the basis of a program that checks for planarity. Um, my software engineering students would probably like the next step in what you've done uh, to, to be shown how to derive that program from the proof. Uh, is that what you do next? The same way as a mathematician defines his, his theorem from the mathematical context. So, th so the idea is not so much to emphasize on the proof, is to emphasize of things before the proof, <laughs> the context. defining all these uh, mathematical contexts. So that's my, my idea. Because, because we know, we know in software, we know in software that, that the, the, the problem is that people rush onto <laughs> programming. Okay, and, and that is the problem. So the, the idea in software, in formal software engineering is to say, don't rush, study the structure. And this is what I call the, 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 the context, the software context, before the implementation. The mathematician do the same, well, I hope, do the same thing, defining the context before the proof. Of course. It's just an analogy. I just would like to add a comment on your last sentence. It was clearly this must be explained very slowly to the students. Yes. In my experience, there's a big danger with it. Because if you explain it very slowly, you lose the good students. So because they get bored. And if you do if you're in front of a class, you need these students to help you through the course. So it is also important, not it's not always a choice that you explain everything slowly, because you must give the people time to think and they should go home and think and I, my, I say quite often to my students you know if you go to my lecture and you understand online everything what I'm saying then it's a waste of time you better read a book then you can individually adjust your, your thing so I don't say don't say that you're wrong but it's not so clear to me The, the difference for the student to, to read the book or to read on the internet and to attend a lecture is um, very important if the lecture is, is not doing just the way I've done it, if, if the lecture is doing it interactively and not with the student. So 
So the idea is I want to present this slowly because I want the student to react. At each point, I want the student to ask questions or to disagree and then we can discuss. Um, and, and then slowly they, 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 they get the context in, in, in their mind. So this is my idea. Of, and this is my very important idea in distinction between reading and between listening to a, to a good professor. Okay, okay unfortunately, we, we don't have time for, for the questions, so uh, thank you, General. <laughs>